Yes, welcome. This is the first uh, Elixir meetup in Malmö, and uh, I'm very excited. So many people could come. Didn't really expect that. Um, and I'm uh, Andreas Runge. I work as a consultant at Jayway. I mainly do uh, JavaScript development, and uh, in my free time I've been learning Elixir. And it's slightly scary to talk about Elixir, because it's a completely different thing to do that professionally and uh, sort of play around with it at home. But the reason why I'm doing this speech is that I'm falling in love with this language. And I feel it surprised me that not more people use it, because I think it's, it feels like it's a wonderful language and platform to use. And I'm surprised that not more people use it. And maybe this first meetup we have here can be a start of something we can do regularly. That's my hope, because I, I feel that there's so much things happen, happening in this community. A lot of new libraries and new things, uh, uh, new, you can have new way of thinking of stuff. So I'm going to start with the uh, uh, introduction to Elixir. And uh, the second half, to depend on the interest, I'm going to have a little course for beginners of Elixir. And it's something I've done, because I believe that one great way to learn things is to teach. So I've done some material for my own sake to learn things. To, and and uh, if interesting, I can start the beginning of that. Maybe we can continue that continuously. But I would also like you in this uh, meetup group that you come with ideas what we can do. There's a lot of things we can do together and have materials. So let's start with a short introduction. And I'm going to just a couple of uh, minutes. The, the author of this uh, uh, language, let him speak, you see if the speaker works. Uh, just three minutes. Let's continue. 
And if you're interested in more funny videos, this is the... Yeah. Do I get this? Yeah, that is quite fun. It's super dry uh, video, so you can look at that. But it's quite fun. It's from the 90s, uh, and we demonstrate the um, capability of this uh, Erlang system. So I'm not going to show it now. Uh, so to explain what uh, Elixir is, you have to start with Erlang. And uh, you talk about Erlang O to P together, because it's, it's uh, more than the language. It's a functional language, and it's also a distributed runtime system, but I think it's more like an operating system. And then it has a huge tooling, libraries, and design pr principles. Um, and it's very old. We started experimenting with this in the 80s. And uh, in 98, it was open sourced, and it came out a paper where they achieved amazing reliability of uh, basically one second every decade, something that the, the, the tech system is not up. And after that, it, I think it was considered as more a niche uh, language. And uh, some companies used it, and I think those companies would maybe not exist today without uh, the Erlang runtime. Uh, and then we have Jose Balim, who is, uh, um, or was, I don't know, um, core uh, he was working with Rails, Ruben Rails. And he was struggling with concurrency problem, and it was really, really complex. And, and then he discovered um, Erlang. And he did it, it's quite an old fashioned language, and he wanted sort of a more modern approach to the language, and he built this. And uh, 2014, this uh, 1.0 came out. And he did it also together to prove that this language also work. Uh, he built this um, uh, web framework, and it's uh, in influenced a bit uh, from Ruby on Rails, but. Uh, it's the uh, same with Elixir also, with Ruby. It's similar sy syntax, but actually it's a completely different language. Um, of course, it's a functional language. And then uh, uh, 2018, NERVS came out, the framework for building embedded sy sy uh, systems, uh, software, uh, IoT solutions. And that's quite fun because uh, Erlang was built for controlling hardware, so now it's coming home again to what it was designed for. Uh, so, it has quite extreme uh, uh, requirements from beginning to build this phone switch. It has to be handled massive concurrency uh, and on uh, many different machines. And it has to talk about soft real time. It means that you must guarantee that it doesn't block. You have to, it has to respond. You can't have something, a process, taking up all the CPU. Uh, and they have a very nice schedulers, a preemption uh, schedule. Make sure that uh, you can't really hang the program. And that's something that an operating system normally have. Uh, and this extreme reliability. Uh, you mustn't take down the system. Imagine a, a phone system that you have to upgrade thing and you can't fool. I mean, it doesn't work. <laughs> and really cool thing with hop swapping of code. So if you want to upgrade something, uh, you can do that without losing any request or anything while the application is running. So. From the beginning, it was mainly used in the telecom, and it is still used by Ericsson. And the next step is quite natural, is the message brokers and messaging apps, like WhatsApp thing. And it's been also developed in some distributed databases, uh, new SQL databases, and very performant web servers. And it's great for uh, data pipelining. You have a lot of events coming in, you want to process them concurrently, back pressure and other things like that. Uh, it's been used in finance and blockchains, and uh, of course with the Phoenix uh, web application uh, framework, you can 
bright web apps and especially with uh, real-time updates, it's, it's great for that because that could be tricky with uh, a Rails application. And now uh, embedded, and I think there's much more use cases where uh, Erlang and Elixir can be used. You know. So a little bit about how. And we have this uh, virtual machine we call the Bean. And it's designed for distributed, uh, it's a distributed operating system for concurrency. And we do that by having a lot of processes. That's, uh, we can have millions of processes that are operating concurrently. And they are completely isolated. We even have um, garbage collection that's uh, independent for each. It's very, very efficient. And the only way to uh, communicate between those uh, processes is by message, message passing. And here is a little view how it works. And each process has a mailbox with a lot of uh, messages we come in. And then it has basically a listener that listens to those messages we come in and then you can update the state or you can also send another message to other processes. And the beauty of this is that the same um, uh, the way they communicate, it doesn't matter if it's on another machine or if it's on the same core or a different core on, on the CPU. It's the same primitives you use to send messages. So it's transparent. And here is the example of what it might look like in Elixir. And here we see a little bit about the syntax, and it's basically the same in, in Erlang. Uh, you organize um, uh, functions in uh, modules. So you have a function loop in, in module my state, which takes one argument. And here we spawn. That's when we create this process, isolate the process, and we get the process identifier. So we can communicate, send messages to this process. And we say which um, module, which method you want to call and the initial value, that is the state. And since it's a um, pure functional language, you don't, you, you never mutate state. What you want to do is to create a copy of a state. And that's what you do in this receive loop. And uh, you get the message. And we, we use uh, uh, pattern matching to see if it's some message we should care about and do something about. And it, if you can uh, update the state, and you do that by recursion. So you create a new state object, and then you go into the loop again and wait for a new message. Or you can also send uh, message back. You've got the from here. That could be the process identifier to send mass, uh, message back. You probably don't see this code very much because it's abstracted away. Uh, so if you write, uh, write a Phoenix app, you don't see that. Uh, so this is very low level code, but it's, it's nice to know. So OTP, just um, back what it is, it's, it's a distributed runtime system with a lot of big tooling. You can imagine being developed for 30 years, it has a lot of tools and libraries. And it also how to design, distribute, configure, reuse. And this is really nice, I think. Uh, yeah. Joe Armstrong, he was here in, in Malmö at Uredev, and I went to one of his tutorials. And, and his view, the, the main benefit of Erlang was this supervisor uh, model to make it extremely reliant, reliable. And uh, you have these processes, and then you can supervise that. That means that you listen to exit signals. If it crash or something happens, then it will sound, oh, I crashed um, to the supervisor, another process. And then that could erect on that. And it's different strategies, what it should do. For example, you can restart it or create a new one with a fail st save state. And you can try that a number of times, for example, 
And if that fails, you can escalate it and take the next up in the tree to try to create a new process. And that's very interesting. But I think it's also, this is the holy grail of software development has been since the 80s of this plug and play Lego bricks we've had and it's never worked since, I mean, object oriented programming thought we should have class libraries and it should be easy peasy. But I think this is one step in the right direction because we have this contract how to design things into pieces and also this runtime component, how to, not only at compile time, how the, uh, the components work, but also in runtime, how they work, and you can reconfigure things while the system is running, which is extremely powerful. So, now we talked about Erlang. So, now we go on to Elixir. And it's also, of course, a functional programming language and it runs on the Erlang uh, virtual machine, and it compiles its code to a bytecode for the beam. So why Elixir, and then the main reason for it exists is it run on, on the Erlang runtime. And it's extremely stable functional language. Since the 1.0 came out, uh, 2014, uh, not much things has really happened in the language, mainly in the standard libraries and some things. And it's probably coming out to 2.0, maybe in a year or two, I don't know. And the main thing that will happen that will remove this deprecation. And it's really nice if you've been working with the crazy Java uh, community. With, you get new frames and libraries yeah, every month. So it's really nice to have these stable things. And that's when you look at um, uh, libraries and you don't see that it has been updated for the last week or month, as a JavaScript developer, you get worried. Oh, but <laughs> if you have a stable language and stable uh, community libraries, then you don't, you, you don't have to update things because it works, it's finished. And the nice thing with Elixir is that it's very extensible, and that's maybe one reason why we don't have to update the language, because it's like a Lisp, meaning that the syntax uh, is, you can describe Elixir program in an Elixir data structure. It means you can create new constructs, uh, and a lot of uh, Elixir language is implemented in Elixir itself. So if there's something missing in the language, you can do it yourself. And I think it's easy to learn. First, because it's a functional language. You don't have this state and class and inheritance and things, it's very easy. But also, uh, some philosophy uh, uh, that we try to be explicit about things. No magic. Don't save some characters. Don't be, it's better to write a little bit more to be clear what you mean than to do something magic things. And yeah. another thing that also important to learn is is it's about fantastic documentation. Just imagine all the time we sp spend googling and uh, Stack Overflow of things, and then you got a fantastic uh, documentation in your editor and with examples and everything. It, it means a lot. Uh, and what Erlang people say about uh, Elixir, they think that the tooling is, is great. Uh, and it comes included with a lot of things that works seamlessly together. Compared to the JavaScript developer, we be struggling with, I don't know how much time I've been working with, with pack and linting and, and all those things, wasting so lot of time. And here you got things that works perfectly from, from beginning. It's really, really nice. And of course, testing support. And even talking about, I don't know, uh, property-based testing should be included because we use that in the core of Elixir 
language. Um, and of course, we got the uh, web framework if you want to do web things. Uh, and the community is really nice. And Jose, uh, it's, it's quite cool. He do a lot of uh, live things. It's, for example, this advent of code he did. Uh, you can. He was live coding this, and, and sometimes he do bug fixes live coding. I mean, it's super cool. Uh, very easy to speak to. Very nice. And I th think also, since we got this runtime, it allows us to rethink how we do things. I'm going to show some example later on what we can do with this runtime. And also, now, it's been a few years since 1.0, there are a lot of companies out there, maybe not so much here in Malmö, but also a lot of books and a lot of conferences here, so there's a lot of information. And of course, there are some reasons why you should not use Elixir. It's never a silver, silver bullet for everything. And if you're doing a lot of number crunching, having math things, you probably should not use Elixir. I think that's quite unusual, but sometimes you have these things. And then maybe better use Go or something else. Uh, and if you want to do a lot of command line scripts, it takes you maybe two, three hundred milliseconds to start up the runtime. So might not be optimal for do command line scripts. And since it's still quite new, it could be some missing libraries that if you're doing some weird things. So I'm going to give some uh, random examples of all those things why I think it's such a fantastic uh, language and platform. Uh, first, I just checked out the uh, Elixir language. Uh, it's extremely well maintained. Uh, I checked this Monday, we had 18 open uh, issues on GitHub. Uh, it's just fantastic. Um, uh -huh. And this, now we're coming into the web framework, uh, and it's really nice uh, way how we treat this. We treat um, a web request as a pipeline of things, coming in an HTTP request, create it, make it into a data structure, and uh, have a lot of plugs that take the data structure and returns new data structures. And out of that comes an HTTP response. It's a really nice concept. New magic or new state somewhere else hidden away. If you want to test things, it's also very simple to do. Uh, and here's the architecture of uh, Phoenix uh, web framework. Everything is plugs, more or less. And if you want to look in the detail how the plug work in, in the Elixir syntax, you use this uh, pipe operator how to uh, send the output to, uh, as an argument to the function. And then, then you can co uh, combine those plugs into a chain, a pipeline like this. Really nice. And uh, when you start learning Elixir, maybe this is the first thing that is, you sort of think, wow, this is super cool. It's available in other languages. But Elixir has been designed from the beginning with pattern matching. And we spent, uh, Joe Armstrong, he, said, he talked about how many years we spent on optimizing this pattern matching. So it's really, really fast. And, and I think it's easy to read. In, in, Elixir, you don't see so much if statements, and I think it's always hard to read if, uh, false, true, I always mix those up. Uh, it's, I think it's easier for the brain to do pattern matching. And here is an example of uh, a pattern matching of function arguments. So we have uh, three functions, and which one is going to be called depends on pattern matching. So if you call it with Zero, the zero match with zero, so then that will return. But we call it with five. Neither the first and second one don't match, but n, yes, you can uh, match that. And we even actually don't have assignment. Assignment is a pattern match thing. Yeah. And here's something I'm very excited about. 
it's been a big talk in the community last year about something about called Live View, but it's not released yet and I couldn't find any information. But I found another open source project that take these ideas. And I invested a little bit about that. And it's about doing racked components on the server side. And I think that's super cool. Uh, lot of possibilities. So here we have a component that is an um, OTP process. And you can have one process for each client. You, you can organize, for example, a web page. Uh, each component, for example, if you have a to-do app, you can have a to-do to list. could be an OTP applica uh, application. You can have a search bar and uh, everything that could be small OTP uh, applications. And when you first load this, you get the static HTML. And you get a small JavaScript library with attached listener to things that happens that will generate uh, messages to these processes that will update the, the DOM. It will be virtual DOMs. It will be quite efficient. Just things that change will be updated. I think that's super cool. A lot of possibilities how to, how to do things. And we don't have to write JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> But this, of course, not ready. This is just experiment. Yeah. Uh, here's uh, the test framework, and this is just an example of the macro design, what you can use that for. Uh, and also, it's not uh, a lot of things that we learn. This, how you write this, you use the same syntax, and that works. I mean, in normal language, this wouldn't work because it would just return. It executed this command, but here you can with macro can actually take in the, uh, the source code, sort of the AST representation of that, and do something nice with that. Present it. This is an example of doing working with macros. Uh, and here's just an example of the documentation. It's always available. You have this repo that you can do tab completion, you get examples. Uh, yeah. And also it's standardized on, on the documentation. So if you publish an open source project, um, all open source project documentation looks the same. It's really nice. Uh, and um, now I've been using uh, VS Code uh, and it's I had looked at uh, Elixir a few years ago, but now the editor, and I think that that's quite important for me to have this integration, to bug things, uh, and all this tooling that we used to. It works great. And not only that, uh, you get documentation, uh, great documentation, and we have some uh, sort of optional typing. So it will uh, figure out uh, what the type is of your uh, function, and you can click on that if you think that's the correct type. And add that. It could be quite nice. Yeah. And here's an example of this uh, framework that I've been looking at, and I. It's, and how easy it is to ac uh, extend the language. Elixir doesn't know anything about HTML or HTTP. Uh, but you can write a macro that extends the language to suddenly understand HTML. And since it's a macro and something that happened at compile time, you can make the editor uh, give you warning on the HTML syntax. It's, it's super cool. And it's not much code to do this thing. It's quite simple. And, and this is very unusual uh, to be able to have to ship one product having all those things. You can. It's possible to replace. You don't have to have database because Alan comes with uh, a number of databases. Uh, I'm not saying that you should 
but you have a possibility to skip third party dependencies. And, uh, and um, because it is like an operating system, so you can install a uh, database and remove it 